Our keynote speaker today is Dr. Radhika Nagpal. Dr. Nagpal is a professor in computer science at the Harvard School of Engineering and Applied Sciences. She is also a core faculty member of the Harvard Wyss Institute for Biologically Inspired Engineering, where she co-led the biorobotics platform. Before becoming faculty, Dr. Nagpal spent a year as a research fellow in the Department of Systems Biology at Harvard Medical School. She received her PhD and was a postdoc lecturer at the MIT Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Laboratory, or CSEL, as a member of the Amorphous Computing Group, supported by the Bell Labs GRPW Fellowship. She has been awarded the Microsoft New Faculty Fellowship in 2005, NSF Career Award in 2007, Anita Borg Early Career Award in 2010, and the Radcliffe Fellowship in 2012. Most recently, Dr. Nagpal was named as one of the Nature 10 Top 10 Scientists and Engineers by the journal Nature in December 2014. She is the advisor for the Harvard Women in CS group and a strong advocate for a nurturing and inclusive culture in science. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Radhika Nagpal, who will speak to us about the mathematics of collective intelligence. All right, so I have a timer to try and keep me on time, not my best property. All right, thanks for uh, having me here. Um, so what I was going to talk to you about today is a little bit about collective intelligence. And by collective intelligence, what I mean is how many simple individuals can come together and do something as a group that you think an individual couldn't possibly do. So I want to start by showing you some examples of examples from nature that inspire me that I think will make you understand what I mean by a collective. So take, for example, ant colonies. And each individual ant is really tiny. But ants together as a group can search vast areas, creating these mini highways right? that can go through and find food. And suppose they find food, for example, that's too large or too big for them to carry alone. They can even band together and grab it and take it with them. And they can deal with obstacles, obstacles that make sense and obstacles that are put by annoying people like me. So you know, there's, these ant colonies are huge and powerful. So are bee colonies. And they do this not on the ground. They actually do this in the air. They can find resources. Insects also build. This is a termite mound that can be 2 to 10 meters high, built by centimeter scale insects. And they work together to create this incredible structure that's even self-repairing. And if you go maybe a level bigger, you can think of fish, you can think of birds. I'm sure many of you have seen around here these starling flocks that seem to swift and move around. Or maybe you've gone snorkeling and you've seen groups of fish. And it's amazing how these huge groups can just turn on a dime and seem to move through complex environments. And all of these systems, what's really fascinating is that there's so many of them. And I find them really fascinating. Lots of people find them fascinating. I think there are a couple of reasons why these systems are so striking to us. And one of the reasons is hopefully going to show up on the screen. OK, I, clicker stuff. So one of the reasons I find them very fascinating is that when you look at an individual, it almost just doesn't make sense. The individual is so tiny compared to the sheer size of the group. And it seems that a group that big just shouldn't be able to coordinate at all. But instead, the group is coordinating. It's coordinating superbly well. And what's more fascinating and sort of surprising is that it does so without leaders. So you know, if you're like me, imagine a classroom and there's no teacher, right? It's chaos, right? Coordination is not what comes to mind. But here are these systems that are like many, many classrooms all together. And there's no teacher, no leader, no supervisor. And yet these systems can coordinate amazingly well. There's no single fish saying where to go. There's no single ant that knows which place to make the highway. So how do these individuals coordinate without any leaders? Well, what we understand is that, in fact, there's some simple rules. Somehow, each of these individuals looks at its neighbors, makes certain decisions, and applies in its simple world what simple rules it can. 
but as a group, the intelligence emerges. So the intelligence is somehow this incredible power in numbers that this intelligence and complexity is arising from individuals that are themselves very limited and imprecise. And this is a really powerful idea. It's a powerful idea in nature. It's a powerful idea in science. It's a powerful idea in engineering. How do we create, or how do we even understand these kind of collectives? So what I was going to do today is start by telling you about one particular example of collective behavior and a little bit about the mathematics behind it. But before we do that, I wanted to do an experiment. Now, I can't actually see everybody, so it's a little hard. Um, so the experiment is going to work as follows. First, I want all of you guys to start clapping. So we're just going to softly clap. OK. All right, good. You can still hear me? Keep, no, keep clapping. OK. Now, close your eyes, second part of the experiment. And don't cheat. All right, eyes closed. OK, now what I want to happen is I want all of us to clap together, as if we were in the audience and it was like an encore, and we're trying to clap all in a group. You can be louder, but try to create a rhythm. Yes. Very nice. OK, we can stop the experiment. All right, so when you close your eyes, I mostly stopped clapping. And when I said you should all synchronize, it's clear that there was no leaders I picked. Actually, I could have seated the audience, but I didn't. Whew, it still worked. Um, but we're amazingly good at going and creating this kind of synchronous pattern. And audiences all over the world do this almost spontaneously, right? It's a great performance. Suddenly, this rhythm emerges. And the question is, what are you doing to make this happen? Clearly, any one of you I'm sure you don't even know how many people are in this audience, let alone what somebody else across the room is doing. But somehow, as a group, we can actually synchronize our actions and do something together. And it turns out that audiences are not the only thing that synchronize. So fireflies that sort of you see in a garden, in certain species of fireflies, they will actually synchronize their flashing. So they flash, and their neighbor flashes with them. And what you see is entire trees, entire lines of trees, where the trees are blinking like Christmas, with all of these fireflies flying, flashing together. And the reason that they flash together is because uh, different species of fireflies have different frequencies with which they flash. So if a whole group gets together and they flash in a pattern, then from a mile away you can see that's the home where that species lives. And so it's like a beacon. Come here, come here, here's where we are. And that, for that reason, synchrony is really powerful. But no one firefly has any idea of how many other fireflies there are. They're kind of like this audience. If you go even smaller, heart cells synchronize. So we think of our heart as having this center called a pacemaker, right? So the pacemaker creates a beat that beats your heart. Turns out that the pacemaker is not a thing. It's actually a tissue. It's 10,000 cells that synchronize their beating actions to beat together. So even that one element is 10,000 tiny individuals that can create this synchrony. If you take the cells separately, they drift apart. If you put them together, they start to synchronize. So all of these systems, you can kind of start to ask the question, well, what does it take to create synchrony? And although we're humans in doing synchrony, if cells can do it, how smart does an individual really need to be? Now, what makes it challenging to understand these systems is, of course, the details are really, really different. A cell, the way it communicates with its cells, is completely different from hearing audio uh, while you're clapping. And all these different areas are also studied in different disciplines. But one of the cool things is that this is where math plays uh, a really important role. Oops. Uh in that we can create math models that abstract away from all of these details and focus on a phenomenon, focus on a concept of collective behavior, a rule, and the impact of that rule in a network, separate from all of the details of these different systems. And not only can those math models allow us to understand all these systems well, like, for example, do, do many rules create synchrony? Do all these ones have to use a particular rule, or are there just many ways to do it? Or if you use a particular rule, is there a particular way you fail in which your heart would, for example, stop beating or beat in a weird way? 
So mathematics can help us understand those questions by abstracting away from all of those details. And it can also lead to new discoveries. So one of the things that people realized is that fireflies and audiences and heart cells also have something deeply in common with fish schools and, and bird flocks. So if you think of a fish school and a bird flock, one of the things is you have all these individuals, maybe 10,000 of them, and they have to decide where to go. And the key thing is to go there together. So they have to align. They have to agree on which direction to go. So it's an example of collective agreement. Well, clapping at the same time is also an example of collective agreement. We have to agree on a phase, on a particular point in time where we clap. And also, we have all different frequencies. We have to agree on a frequency to clap. So in fact, all of these systems are an example of the spontaneous emergence of agreement in a group. So not only are fireflies related to flocks, but the spontaneous emergence of synchrony is also similar to the spontaneous emergence of, fish uh, of agreement. So maybe that's why all these systems can do it. Maybe there's something fundamental about agreement that as a group we can actually do this really, really well. So in the next few slides, what I wanted to do was show you um, one example of how we might analyze or how we might understand the spontaneous agreement. Why is it it would work at all if no one is in charge? And to do that, I'm going to use a toy example. Toy examples are always really useful. Uh, and the toy example is that of a photographer. So you have a photographer, and there's a whole bunch of award winners in a line. And the photographer says, I want to take a picture, but it's really inconvenient that you all are different heights. So some people are tall, some people are short, and it would just be really nice if everyone could just adjust themselves a little bit so everyone's at an equal height. So if you're too tall, you should crouch. If you're sort of too short, maybe you can stand on your tiptoes or stand on a stool, and we're just trying to get everybody at the same height. So that's the goal, go for it. So the problem is, of course, what height, right? What do we agree on? Um, and how do we come to agreement? So if I think of just one of the people, like this purple person here, um, the problem for, for me in that situation is I can only see the people to the left and right of me, and I don't know how many people are in the line. So the only actions I can take have to be based on the people I can see next to me. And uh, I don't really know what's going on in the rest, so I can keep trying to take actions based on my neighbors. So one possible individual rule I could use is to try and make my local world better. And this actually turns out to be an individual rule that works. So as an individual, what I'm going to do is, let's say I see the situation where both people next to me are taller than me, then I'm going to stand up on my tippy toes. Or if they're both shorter than me, then I'm going to try and crouch down a little bit. And then there might be some situations where I don't do anything at all. So for example, if everyone next to me is the same height as me, then we're done. I don't need to do anything. Um, or it might be a situation where somebody is higher than me and somebody is lower than me, and then there's nothing I can do to improve the situation, so I'll stay put. And so as an individual, what I'm going to do is just repeatedly apply this rule. So we can formalize this rule uh, in, in the form of a simple equation that just says that my new height is going to be whatever my old height was, whatever I decided in my last uh, iteration, plus some adjustment. And that adjustment is going to be the sum of differences with my neighbors. So I'm going to look at how much my neighbors differ from me. And based on that, I'm going to make some adjustment to my height. And that's it. It's a very, very simple rule. OK. So now, let's say everybody repeatedly applies this rule. So the question is, will we all end up at the same height? Now, that's not totally obvious, right? Because first of all, you know, this person here sees two people shorter than them. They might decrease their height. But then this one might increase her height. And this one at the end might decrease her height, but then later on may increase her height. And so as an individual, you're actually just making mistakes all the time. right? So how do we know that there aren't just going to be mistakes in the system forever, right? as opposed to everyone coming to some kind of consensus, some kind of agreement? So it turns out that in this case, this rule will work. In fact, we will all come to an agreement on height. And not only that, the height will pick is the average height. So even though I don't know how many people are in the line, I don't know anything beyond my neighbors, 
I can actually compute the average of the entire group as an individual because of our collective actions. And that's an example where the collective is really transcending what an individual knows or what an individual could do. So the next thing I'm going to show you is how do we know that this rule is going to work? How would you prove this kind of system? And this kind of proof is actually used many, many times now to uh, explain collective behavior with various variations on it, but it's a really powerful tool. Um, so how do we go ahead and prove this? So the first thing we are going to use in this, in this proof is the notion of a fixed point. So a fixed point is basically, will the system stop? Right? How do we know that the system is going to stop at all? Well, one thing we can see from this rule is that if everybody is at the same height, then nobody's going to move, which means everyone's going to be at the same height, which means nobody's going to move. So whatever function we have to change the behavior of the system, that function always just spits out the same answer, gets the same input, spits out the same answer. So we know that if we actually arrive at the answer, we will stop. And that is a good thing. That is a good thing in a system that needs to arrive at an answer. It would be bad if that was not true. Now, I haven't talked about it, but we'd also want to prove that this is the only fixed point, that you couldn't get stuck in some other state where nobody does anything, but you haven't come to agreement. But at least for now, we know that agreement is a fixed point of the system, and we will stop. The second problem is, let's say we're not at agreement yet. Um, some people think there are agreement. Some people think there's not. What I need to know is that we will improve as a group even if individuals make mistakes, that globally somehow we're going to come closer to the answer. So I want to prove global improvement, because I know local improvement is not true. We're just going to keep messing things up. So the idea is, if everybody applies the rules, we get closer to the answer. So now, what does closer to the answer mean? We can actually define some sort of error term. So we can say, OK, what is the error of the system? And there are many ways to think about error, but this is one way to think about error. So in this particular case, I know that everybody should come to a particular average height. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to look at the deviation from error. So how many people have a height that is not equal to the error, sum it all up, uh, take a square of it or absolute so that positive and negative both count. And now I'm just seeing how, much, how far away are we from the answer. And then the next thing you do is you want to prove the following. You want to prove that after everybody applies the rule and I compute the new error, that that second number is smaller, right? that my error has decreased. So I want to prove that my error over time is decreasing or my error from one step to another is that difference is strictly positive. All right, so how do we do that? Well, that's all algebra. So you stick in the formulas for error which we defined above. You know how to define height at time t plus 1 in terms of height t. That was our rule. You stick it all in. You get some big equation. And then you start moving things around. And then you start figuring out what facts can you use. Like two positive numbers, when you add them together, are still positive. Or they become larger if neither of them are 0. And all kinds of number facts plus algebra. And all of a sudden, miraculously, you have a proof. So the cool part is you can actually do more. Like in some cases, you could actually show that maybe the error decreases by half at every time. And then you would know that if I can keep chopping the error by half at every step, then my answer is going to come exponentially quickly. So now you have a system that's really quick at coming to agreement. And all these kind of things are possible. They're all sort of based around this error, error metric. So I will say, though, that first of all, not all error metrics work. This is where the problem solving part comes in. And also, sometimes you're just wrong, right? So you pick this error metric, you try to prove it, and you realize, oh my god, there's multiple fixed points, and some of them are really, really bad. And you look and you realize that your system actually can get stuck in weird states. And that is a new discovery. And that's also pretty cool. And that one side, I think, is different a little bit about science, is that sometimes coming to not the right answer is also just as valuable as coming to the right answer. So discovering, for example, what situations are going to put your heart into an arrhythmia, right, which is another fixed point that's really bad, that's a really valuable thing to understand. All right. So I've shown you this basic proof structure for a line, which I think all of us could actually do together. 
Um, but over many decades, people worked together, mathematicians, physicists, biologists, computer scientists, applied mathematicians. There's a huge field of people who have contributed to this, trying to bring our understanding of this forward. And now we can actually prove many results about synchrony and agreement on all kinds of complex networks. So if you think about fireflies or audiences, it's actually not like the height problem because your eyes were closed and you only get little bits of information. You're getting pulses of information and you still have to do the right thing. Or if you think about flocks, uh, it's like a line that is constantly being shuffled because every time a fish moves, it ends up with new neighbors, it may end up with new neighbors. And so imagine that you were just constantly shuffling the line while trying to run your algorithm for agreement. Is this gonna work? Yes, it actually does and math can show us how. And those sort of things are really, really exciting discoveries that have helped us understand systems where the rules are really simple, but understanding why it works is not at all simple. So I have no idea how I'm doing on time. Oh, God. OK. All right, well, I'm barely on time. OK, so the other thing I wanted to show you was a, was a slightly different segue, which is what I've talked about so far is natural systems. Uh, but one, and my group works on the mathematics of natural systems. But we also work on building our own artificial systems. So imagine that not only did you have fish and ants and cells working together, but you could have robots working together. And one reason to have a model organism that's not natural is that then we can invent our own rules. We can explore rules. We can change the way rules are. We can be certain what rules we put in. And we can be certain about the circumstance in which they run. And we can be like a biologist but with a system that is truly under our control to try and understand what kinds of behaviors emerge. So this is what motivated the Kilobots project, which is we built these small robots. I've brought a couple of just show and tell robots um, that work together as a group and where we can program different behaviors. And a single robot does just a couple of simple things. It has two motors, vibration motors, like your cell phone motors that it uses to move, so it can move and drive left and right. It can talk with its neighbors and it can measure distances with its neighbors using a simple wireless channel. And it's a computer. We can program it with different kinds of local rules. Whatever local rule you want to experiment with, you can program it. So here's a couple of very simple behaviors, um, you know, just moving by itself or measuring distances and kind of orbiting its neighbors or trying to follow a leader. And those are all simple behaviors. Uh, but with that, we can actually recreate some of the behaviors we were talking about. So here is clapping for my robots. And there are some really interesting behaviors that emerge before you actually come to agreement. So each robot here is actually only talking with about five or 10 neighboring robots. So the group doesn't, it also doesn't know the group. We can also look at pattern formation. This is another really important collective behavior that cells do. Um, that all kinds of organisms rely on. And we can try to recreate those behaviors uh, and see how robust are such behaviors, how do they fail, what kinds of things cause patterns to fail. We can also look at collective movement. So as I showed you, they have little vibration motors that move together that they can also track and move to the light. I hope this would be. So collective transport is something I'm very interested in. Um, but just in general, like collective movement is really, really amazing. And one of the things that we get for free with robots is variation. As you can see, we actually program them all to do the same thing, but they never do. They do something. And this is sort of mimics natural variation in the world. So another thing that we like to do is try to invent our own collective behaviors, kind of moving from the scientist to the engineer, or maybe asking yourself, do I understand a system so well that I could engineer variations of it. So could I engineer an algorithm that had robots working together to create, self-assemble into arbitrary shapes? So this is an example of one of the most complex experiments we've run. There's a thousand robots that are working together to form a starfish shape. And in the beginning, no robot knows where it's going to end up. There's no leader robot. But they're actually running a pattern formation algorithm to try and find a place where each robot sticks. And as they stick, they try to create this huge structure that is many, many magnitudes larger than the knowledge of any single robot that's in it. And we can program these rules. We can actually understand and mathematically prove 
What kinds of shapes can be self-assembled this way? What kinds of failures would you expect to see? Um, and we can experimentally discover other kind of failures that maybe mathematically we forgot to model. So if you look at this system, you might say, OK, why would you ever want to have a bunch of robots self-assemble into something tiny? Well, I just point to Big Hero 6 that has done my pitch for me, right? Clearly, we need tiny robots that self-assemble for good, not for bad, right? OK, so imagine that we could shrink this. And I'm not, you know, there's actually a whole bunch of us are working on thinking about self-assembling structures. Or if you had larger robots, you could imagine that they could actually do something like build a, a temporary bridge or shore up a temporary structure. Um, but all these different kinds of collective behaviors, we still you know, are beginning to understand through understanding nature and through creating our own systems. And I think there's just a lot of actual problems, um, problem solving that can be done with collective systems. So for example, if you think of monitoring the ocean or you think of creating levees um, in disaster areas, imagine being able to have a robot fish school that monitored it or a bunch of robots that pollinated flowers or moved sandbags around. Or even if you think of a future where you have a whole bunch of self-driving cars, we are going to have collectives that we need to manage. And all of this mathematics that we learn from natural systems is going to really influence how well we can create those kind of robust systems ourselves in our own society. All right, so what can thousands of individuals do together as a collective? I hope I've given you a bunch of different examples you can, you can think about. And there's so many more we don't understand, which makes it a lot of fun to have my job. Speaking of my job, there's one other thing that collectives do together, and that's science. So everything that I've shown you um, is the product of collective intelligence. Echoing what was said before, I actually never knew what I wanted to do, and I still don't know what I want to do. So in case you were thinking that you're going to figure it out once and for all, I'm sorry to burst your bubble. But every five years, I'm not sure what I'm going to do. And I'm pretty sure that at the beginning of my faculty position, I declared that I would never build robots. Right? I have a 1,000 robots. Right? I have like one of the biggest robot swarms. I would never build robots. So I would never do biology. I would never build robots. I really dislike mechanical engineering. And here I am doing all of those things. But the truth is, if I had to do them alone, that would be a really daunting activity. But we don't do science alone. We don't solve mathematics alone. We don't solve any of these problems alone. And so I have this amazing group of people who I work with who have different qualities, different properties. And together, we completely transcend what any one of us could actually accomplish on our own. And we build on people behind us and people in front of us. And so in all ways, science is also a collective activity. And math is an essential part of this, and women are an essential part of this. So I'm really, really delighted to be here. And I hope that you'll continue to find activities, continue to be an active part of this collective, because I think that this is the way we break new ground in science and we break new ground in culture. This is how we, how we change the world. So thanks for having me, and I'm happy to take any questions if I didn't take up all the time. <laughs> all right, thank you. All right, it will be hard for me to see. Anybody want to ask me some question? Just speak up. Yeah, I actually just can't. I know a lot of stuff went by very fast. How about I ask a question? What is your favorite collective behavior that you've seen that you like? Anyone want to volunteer one? Oh, I have someone back there. You'll have to yell. Uh, flash, mobs. flash mobs. I was hoping. And you, will, you may or may not believe this. There is somebody studying flash mobs. <laughs> they put cameras on top, and they actually track what people do um, and also what, the, what people around do, like what actually is the reaction of the crowd. And that's a really, that's a really fun example. Anyone else want to volunteer one? I actually just can't see. All right, it's OK. It's not. 
I always thought Big Hero 6 was, you know, had taken all this, the steam away from me. Anyways, thank you for having me here, and I'm sure everyone's waiting for the awards.